Good evening. I'm Tim Blessy. And I'm Anna Marlott. And welcome to Tools at Tea Time, special edition. Right on the heels of star English teacher Ruby Rule's announcement this week that after signing a $100 million deal, she is leaving her faculty team in Ohio to join the staff of Team Public School 431 in New York, this big announcement just in from Denver. After only recently being outbid by Red Rocks Amphitheater for Beyonce's summer 2021 tour, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science managed to upstage the popular venue by getting none other than Pat Brown. Yes, nationally recognized author and science education leader Patrick Brown has joined the list of all-star educators bringing his show to Denver this summer. He will be appearing live in the museum's prestigious Studio 201 venue from June 24th to June 25th. So get your tickets now since the critics predict sold out houses. In an exclusive interview, Tools at Tea Time News has managed to get Pat Brown online for special 45-minute preview edition starting right now to tell us more about the award-winning show that he's bringing to Denver this summer. So, Pat, welcome to Tools at Tea Time. Okay, everybody, for real, let's welcome Pat to Tools at Tea Time. <laughs> welcome, Pat. Glad to have hey. you. Thanks. That was amazing. That was awesome. Yeah, I am. Uh, I am so excited to be here today um, and to uh, share a little bit more about the work that I do with Explore Before Explain Teaching and to give you a, a really good preview of for what we have planned for you this summer. So let me go ahead. I'm going to share my screen and uh, we'll get we'll jump right in. Should be good to go. Let us need it. Let us know if you need anything. All right, great. Well, uh, again, my name is uh, Pat Brown, and the, the theme of the talk is really uh, exploring instructional sequence matters and explore before explain teaching. So uh, you can find me at Twitter. I also have a web page here that gives a little bit uh, more uh, information about the types of work I do. But uh, what I really want to do is I want to jump right in and, and show you what explore before explain teaching looks like. Um, so what I have pre uh, prepared for you today for the short time that I'm with you is we're going to look at what is Explore Before Explain, um, how you can transform your lessons to fit this model, and then the Next Generation Science Standards, three-dimensional learning, and the frameworks, it's, it's a huge national movement. We're going to look at ways that you can better address those different uh, sets of standards through your uh, instructional approaches. So before I, I get too far into it, uh, there is a proposition that uh, Explore Before Explain teachers, they, they have, and it's, it's a similar proposition that most of us have. It's that, that all students can learn at, at high levels. So although most of us have that goal for kids, we don't always know how we can make that a reality. So in order to work for change, I, I really consider three things when I'm thinking about working with teachers and also when we're, we're moving to explore before explain teaching. The first is that we've really got to understand our own beliefs about teaching to make sense of new practices. So understanding uh, what works for us, what worked for our students, um, and some of our past experiences can be critical in the change process. Uh, step two is that um, and this comes really from working with, with hundreds of teachers over the years, is that we have a lot of difficulty implementing overly challenging plans or multiple plans are unrelated. So everything that I'm gonna do uh, is very focused and intentional. And then lastly, um, we can benefit from rethinking current structures as opposed to creating all new ones from scratch. So I, I like to think of this third one as uh, using an iterative process versus inventing something all brand new from scratch that didn't uh, exist before. And as we'll get further into this, I'll show you how you can, uh, how you can uh, scale up some of the things that you're doing rather than having to create something all new from scratch. Okay. So in a nutshell, Explore Before Explain teaching it really focuses on three critical components. So we're gonna start with uh, this phase where we're engaging students' prior ideas. We're gonna understand their background experiences. 
we're really going to set the stage for learning and we're going to ground it in uh, phenomena and things that happen in their everyday lives. Step two is all, all based on constructing evidence-based claims. So we want to give kids firsthand experiences with data that's going to serve as evidence for their sense making before we jump in and explain any scientific terms or, or give them vocabulary. We really want students' firsthand experiences to be their foundation, their foundational experiences for understanding. And then lastly, we're going to look at ways that we can explain the underlying concepts so that students really understand the scientific principles. This is going to allow them to talk the talk of science, use science vocabulary. It's going to allow them to sophisticate understanding. Okay. Now, Explore Before Explain, it's really based on three big points from the research, and I always like to keep these in mind when I'm uh, showing teachers model lessons or going through the process, uh, because this is what really undergirds the approach. So uh, step one or, or key point one is that students, regardless of their background experiences and what they've had in science, they have ideas about phenomena when they enter their classroom. So some of these ideas are correct, some of them are not correct, uh, but they're all going to come with some sort of uh, set of ideas and experiences that they use to, uh, to justify those. Uh, number two, alternative conceptions and inaccurate ideas, they're tenacious. Uh, the soundness and usefulness of ideas is going to be strengthened when, act, when students actively look for data that serves as evidence for their sense making. So just to say that a little bit differently, if we really want to combat those alternative conceptions or misconceptions, we've got to ground our practice in experiences that students have with data firsthand. And then lastly, and this is really where the sequence of instruction comes in, is that we've got to allow for what I like to call just-in-time learning. So the best learning is going to occur when students facilitate the process and there's this gradual construction of ideas over time. So these are good points to keep in mind as, as we go through Explore Before Explain and what it looks like. And um, I'd, I'd like to just jump right in and I'd like to show you a model lesson. So the first model lesson that I'd like to do for you is a model lesson that involves matter and interactions. Um, it's a grades K through two lesson, but it could also be grades three through five or six through nine. So a lot of the things I do are uh, easily uh, scalable up or scalable down. Um, we just really got to think about the intended content in them, okay? So this model lesson with matter and interactions, I'm going to, I'm going to start it right off with the Understanding Student Idea Probe by uh, Paige Keeley. So this is one of Paige Keeley's probes from her uh, K2 book. And um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about this scenario. It's a watermelon and a grape. And um, use the chat box. I'd like you to chat in what you think students would respond. Uh, so what would they think? So comparing a watermelon and a grape, which one's going to sink, which one's going to float. Maybe they both sink, maybe they both float. Uh, if you could ch chat in some ideas uh, based on what you think students would say, uh, that would be great. And I'll kind of watch them as, as you're chatting in and thinking about it. Caitlin says the watermelon will sink and the grape will float. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Caitlin. Both float, Bev says. The watermelon will sink, the grape will float. Tracy, we got Anna, watermelon and grape will both float. Awesome, yeah. yeah. So we got a, a lot of ideas out there. So it's a, a great opportunity to investigate it. And this is one that it's it just very easy to, to explore firsthand. So um, what I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and we are gonna explore it, but I wanna show you just a really quick uh, video clip of a first grader and what he's thinking about it before we explore it. Hey, Patrick, okay. it's interesting too. One person gave a reason. John says yeah. the watermelon will sink because it weighs the most. Ah, yeah. and I, I appreciate John's reason because that's the most common reason cited in the literature and the research that kids kids say. They base it on how something will feel and, and based on the, on the weight. 
So let's let's watch here. Uh, this first grader, his name's Harry. What he thinks, uh, Harry. Uh, by the way, he's he's my nephew, so uh, he was willing to do this for me over the weekend. So oh, let's go ahead. Let's take a look at this. Harry, this investigation is all about uh, sinking and floating. So we're going to look at some different objects, and I'm going to ask you whether they you think they sink or float before. Uh, I actually do it. And I'm going to have you tell me a little bit about your thinking behind those ideas. So the first two I want to do is, you've seen this before. It's a watermelon. Okay. Yeah, I know that's going to sink. That's going to sink. That's heavy. Okay, what about this? This is a grape. What do you think? Well, I think they're going to float. You think the grape's going to float? Okay. So tell me yeah. a little bit more. So why do you think the watermelon will sink but the grape will float. Because the gra grape um, doesn't weigh that much than the watermelon, because the watermelon, the weight would just push it down. All right, so what do you want me to do first? You want me to do the watermelon or the grape? Um, grape. Okay, you ready? Are you watching closely? Yeah. No! What did it do? It sank. It sank. Okay, so now I'll get the water. But I know the water months. Not gonna. What do you think it's gonna do? I think it's gonna sink. It has to. Okay, let's see. Ready? I no. Oh, it <laughs> that's sinking. That's sinking a little bit. Very. This is my hand underneath the water right here. Is it sinking or floating? It's sinking a little bit. It's sinking a little bit, but is it sinking all the way? No. <laughs> it's supposed to. It, no, but really, I I tested it <laughs> this before once. You I tested it before. It. <laughs> I, I I love that video um, because, well, a lot of reasons. I mean, there's definitely an element of surprise because uh, he his his ideas were not right. And then he sort of goes into this explanation that he's tested it before. And I think there's a lot of ways you can interpret this. And, you know, from working with a lot of kids, uh, you know, the, they say certainly say funny things like Harry said, but I I interpret this to mean, you know, he's tested things before that have some weight to them. And those objects that weighed more than maybe other objects, like maybe a, you know, maybe threw a rock in that that sunk. I seriously doubt he's ever tested a watermelon before in a grape, but, but maybe he has. But, you know, he's really trying to sort of justify why those incoming ideas were, were slightly different um, than what he actually experienced. So, Experiences like this are, are extremely powerful for students because it's it, it is yeah I watch it is data for their sense making um, and and the data basically shows them that that weight alone isn't going to determine whether an object sinks or floats. So I, I followed this one up uh, with another one and in the second one what I do is I do an orange. So uh, let's go ahead and let's watch it because I'll explain it to Harry uh, when I do it. Okay. Well, about the or the oranges, um, I don't completely sure if they're gonna sink or, or something. Okay, so with the oranges, the with the oranges, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna do first. I'm gonna put an orange in there with the peel on it, and then I'm gonna take the peel off. So and see how much weight and see how much weight it, it is with it taking off. Well, I'm just going to see whether it sinks or floats. So what do you think would happen with the orange? So with the orange, with the peel, do you think it's going to sink or float? I don't know on yeah. either one. Okay. What do you think when I take the uh, peel off? What do you think is going to happen? I still don't know. You don't know? Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. Okay. So you ready? All right. You've introduced okay, doubt about his rule. Orange out? Okay, yeah. so here's the orange with the peel on it. It flew up. Okay, it flew up. Now I'm going to see what it does when I take 
So now I'm going to take the peel off. He wants to know. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. What do you think it's going to do when I take that peel off? I think it's. Um, I think it's kind of just going to be the same thing. It's gonna I be don't know. Thing. Okay. Well, let's go ahead. We can test it, right? So now there's no peel. It's sink. Yeah. So let me ask you, what do you think these peels are going to do? Make it flow. You think they're going to float? <laughs> yeah, so I, I I love those videos because yeah, definitely in the first one, although Harry is not sure what's gonna happen, he's he's very interested at this point. Uh because he he's had some background experiences now uh that you know they really kind of conflicted with what, what his initial thoughts were. Um and, and he's he's building building knowledge and understanding. Okay. So in terms of explore before explain that what you saw was really the explore part and the explanation we're going for it's really pretty basic here so definitely at the K2 level what I'm looking for is that shape and size alone do not determine whether an object sinks or floats. And I really want this to be based on students conceptual understanding that they're starting to develop like this lesson in itself it's not going to it's not going to fully develop that idea, but it's certainly uh, starting to build that solid foundation that uh, physical properties are uh, like sinking and floating. It's, it's not just dealing with, with the weight and the size of, a, of an object. So um, that's really the crux of the Explore Before I Explain, really providing experiences for students to really kind of put their ideas out there first doing some, uh, some data-based uh, investigation and then following up with, with an explanation. So there's a lot of different ways you can go with this. So uh, definitely with grades K through two, we're focusing on size, shape. This is where I might teach kids a little bit about how to measure weight and mass and then sinking and floating. It, it sets up perfectly uh, investigations of mass to volume ratio, because really what's going on here, it, it's, a, it's a density issue. And the differences in densities between those watermelons, the grapes, and even between the orange with and without the peel it is, and whether it sinks or floats is explained by density, okay? So I love this model lesson. It, it, uh, it's always nice to kind of see how the kids respond to it. And it, it just sort of shows that, you know, when kids have the, the opportunity to explore these things, uh, we can really sort of get at their prior ideas and their knowledge and start to develop deeper conceptual understanding. Okay. I have another one that I'd like to show too, and this is a model lesson I, I like to do across all the grade levels as well. It deals with properties of light, okay? So it's grounded in this idea about uh, how do objects look uh, in, in different scenarios? So have you ever looked at an object underneath water? Does the object look exactly like it does on dry land, okay? So a common phenomena that, that uh, a lot of kids and students and adults experience all the time, but a lot of times they don't really think about the reason why things don't appear exactly as, the, as they are. So for this one, I'm going to model this a little bit differently. So the way I'm going to model it is we're going to look at a couple different scenarios and we're going to look at how objects appear in, in basically uh, three different situations. One is going to be if we're looking at a test tube in a beaker and we just have air there. So another way to think about this is if I put a test tube in a beaker, what would the bottom of that test tube look like? So in my visual there where the question marks, if I was looking at that, what would that bottom of the test tube look like? In the second situation, uh, what would that test tube look like if there was water in the test tube and water in the beaker? And then in the last situation, I'm going to put cooking oil in the beaker and cooking oil in the test tube. 
So really what I'm getting at here is, you know, students have experiences looking at objects out windows. So, you know, really the only thing between them and sort of outside is the glass and air. They have experiences looking at things underwater. And then I've added this cooking oil one to it as well, just to make the experience a little bit more meaningful. Um, so let's go ahead. We're going to start and uh, we're going to look at it first with air and air. Okay, so the test tube looks pretty similar. So uh, it looks actually identical. So it would be very similar to looking at something outside the window. Next, we're gonna look at it with water and water. So the test tube, it looks magnified, it looks broken. Those are all uh, different things those students will say. So I add water to the test tube now. Actually adding the water makes it just a little bit more clear how that test tube really looks broken at the surface. Okay, and the last one I'm gonna do is uh, the oil and the oil. And Pat, this summer we'll be doing stuff like this live, right? Absolutely, yeah. We're gonna be we're gonna be doing stuff like this definitely live. Thanks for shooting all this video, though. Yeah. Ah. always kind of blows the student's mind. It looks like it it disappears, right? Yeah. Okay. So a really fun one to do. I I always have the kids make a prediction beforehand and. Um, I probably should have done that with my participants today, but just as a little bit of a, as, as the insight of what kids typically predict, it, you know, they've, they've seen things through the window. They don't really think it's going to change much. So their predictions are basically, it's not going to do much. Water and water, they'll think it's magnified. Oil and oil, I get some pretty interesting things. They'll say it's going to look magnified even more than the water and water. So that's a common one. Another common one I'll get is they'll say, because the water and water made it look magnified, the oil and the oil, it must shrink it. So it's gonna look like it's smaller. Um, I have never had a kid that, uh, that hasn't already seen this say that it's gonna disappear. So this is truly one that, that really um, it opens their eyes to the different things and the different ways that different uh, materials influence the light and what we see. Okay, so in terms of the explanation for this one, uh, students can make a variety of different explanations or evidence-based claims, I should say, based on what they what they've noticed. At the grades uh, K through two and even three through five, I'm looking for fairly simple explanations. So they'll notice that different materials influence what they see. Air and glass does not change what they see. Glass and water, it changes what they see. And some materials like that oil and glass together, they drastically change what they see. So really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build that foundational understanding that, that light has different properties and it behaves in different ways when it is in contact with different mediums. And those different mediums are, are water, oil, and glass, okay? Upper elementary, so three through five, and then also middle school, we're going to look at uh, refractive indexes. And I'm going to share this sort of data with students, and I'm going to have them look at the data for some patterns. Okay. And it's not so important that the kids understand what the values actually are, but that there is a pattern in this data that uh, relates to their firsthand experiences. So in only one case, the corn oil, which was a liquid in that Pyrex glass that I use, did the refractive indexes uh, completely match. They were both 1.47. Interestingly, also, 
in that case, and it's really one of the only cases, do I have a situation where I can make something look invisible? So students are starting to develop this idea that if I wanted to make something look invisible, I'd have to have 100% matching refractive indexes, okay? And then lastly, I just wanted to share this, and I'm not gonna go into a ton of details, but at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade level, we get into FET, and FET has just an amazing simulation that allows kids to, to explain exactly what's going on. And we are gonna do this in the, in the workshop this summer. I'm gonna get you into FET. I'm gonna get teachers into FET. And we're gonna use this to explain it. But basically what FET does is you're able to pick two different materials. You're able to set the refractive indexes, and then you can measure both the speed of light and the angle at which the, the light is traveling through those different mediums. And that's really key to understanding why that material, uh, why that test tube looks invisible. So you've got to understand what's happening to the speed of light, what's happening to the angle that the light is traveling, at those refractive indexes, that 1.47, and then they're able to really explain um, of how you can make something look invisible. So really, really cool. Um, we'll do a, a deep dive into FET this summer, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of an explanation and a, a place you can go to really kind of understand that concept a, a little bit deeper. So in terms of teacher notes, again, K through two, I'm just really looking at materials and how light passes through them. Grades three through five, we're using it to talk about reflection and sort of how light bounces off an object and comes back to the eye in order for us to see it. And then six through eight, this is where some of the terms that you all are probably familiar with really come in, like reflection, refraction, absorption, and transmittance. And of course, those terms, we're not introducing them until the students have had the firsthand experiences. We're using that disappearing test tube as the hook for really attaching meaning to these terms. So the terms are coming, coming second in the, in the whole process, okay? So I wanna just really quickly kind of talk about how you can transform your lessons. And this is gonna be a, a huge part of the summer session uh, because uh, there's some details that go, go along with it. But for you all today, I wanna to just kind of break it down into three simple steps. So um, before I show you those three simple steps, so what I do wanna say is that if we just look at the most common instructional sequence that science teachers use, it's a three-step or three-phase sequence. It starts with an explanation phase where the teacher basically gives the information to the students either through a lecture or a discussion or a reading. The second phase is kids have an opportunity to investigate it, do some hands-on, and usually the purpose is to verify what the teachers told them. And then the last phase is, is to practice and the kids sort of rehearse the ideas. Maybe they do worksheets or they do vocabulary type activities. And I, I like to talk about the, the traditional approach because oftentimes when I'm working with teachers, we use the traditional approach to translate into an explore before and explain. And if you're doing hands-on, if you're doing that middle part, the investigate and the observe, then you can translate your sequence into an explore before explain by making some uh, simple shifts in your instructional sequence, okay? So the first step in the process is really pinpointing the evidence-based experience you're gonna use with kids, okay? So it's either identifying a demonstration, a simplified lab that you're doing, and really making that sort of the centerpiece of that lesson so thinking through what evidence-based experiences kids could have. So in addition to identifying that hands-on experience that you already probably have in your curriculum, we're gonna think a little bit differently about how we talk with students. So during that phase, we're gonna, or during that step, we're gonna really focus on helping kids go from data to evidence to claims. So the first step in the process is it's really, it's really identifying something that you're already doing that's hands-on and then thinking about how you're gonna talk with students a little bit differently so that they're the ones constructing the knowledge based on those firsthand experiences. 
And I, I can't emphasize enough that this step is absolutely critical. So first off, if, if kids are making evidence-based claims, there's only one way to do that. They've got to blend the disciplinary core ideas, science and engineering practices, and cross-cutting concepts from the frameworks. So it's an NGSS-minded approach to, to curriculum design. The second is it's going to develop basically that foundational understanding. Kids' conceptual framework for knowing the science is going to be based on the data that they are starting to construct firsthand. And then lastly, it really models how science works. So the nature of science, you know, uh, the accumulation of data serves as evidence for sense making. So very much like scientists that develop theory based on, by, on data and evidence that explains the world, students' evidence-based claims are, are, are very much like those theories. So uh, students are doing that work of scientists, okay? So once you have that evidence-based experience pinpointed, we're gonna work backwards a little bit. We're gonna think about ways uh, we can elicit students' ideas. So I call this transformation step two. So um, this is where I look for an understanding student idea probe. I almost always go to Paige Keeley's work. She's done the hard work for so many of us science teachers. I'm gonna see, does she have a probe that matches my firsthand experiences? If she doesn't have a probe, I'm gonna to try to create one myself. So the thing I love about the understanding student idea uh, probes is that there's a, a format that's used in those. Typically, there's a selected response followed by an open-ended question. So it allows kids both to, to choose an idea and then to give you a little bit more about their experiences, okay? If I can't find an understanding student idea probe or I can't figure out how to make one up on my own, I'll, I'll simply have kids make a prediction or, or just make statements about what they wonder before I do a demonstration. I'm always eliciting their ideas and uh, explanations or rules behind why they're uh, creating those ideas before I'm jumping in and, and really doing the science, okay? And then transformation step three is where I'm thinking about how I'm going to sophisticate understanding. So this is where my readings, discussions, simulations, and the academic vocabulary come in. So at the grades uh, K through five, I love using trade books. Uh, and then six through eight, we have textbooks that we often use. But this is where I'm thinking really purposefully about where are trade books and sections of trade books and even sections of, of the textbooks that relate firsthand to students' experiences. And, and this is where I'm introducing the academic vocabulary. So if I really want kids to make sense of that vocabulary, I've got to connect it to those evidence-based experiences that they're having. This is also where I, I'm making a lot of connections with simulations. And, and FET has been wonderful for, for our teaching because many times they provide explorations of, of subatomic things that kids cannot easily see firsthand or can't see uh, firsthand at all. So it gives them basically a visual for explaining the underlying scientific principles. Okay, so I like to keep my transformation and, and my, uh, my process fairly simple. It's a three-step process. So, uh, honing in on the explorations that I'm already doing and moving them up in my sequence, finding a way to better know and understand student ideas and starting with that, and then having an explanation that's very purposeful, but leaving it towards the end or at the end of the sequence so that kids can make the most amount of sense of those principles in the vocabulary. Okay. So uh, I know we're getting close to, to time, but there's just a couple more things that I want to hit with you. Uh, especially, I want to talk a little bit about the standards and the frameworks, because I think we're all in this position of how can we teach better? You know, how can we teach in ways that are NGSS minded and, and meet the frameworks? And what I like to say is that the standards are not the curriculum. Um, and how you develop the lessons and how you sort of contextualize them are going are gonna to be the basis for which dimensions of those frameworks emerge. What I will say, and I, I alluded to this earlier, uh, 
if students are making an evidence-based claim, then they have to use the special combination of the three dimensions. So they have to use the science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts to make a claim about, about the content, okay? With Explore Before Explain Teaching, and this is actually just a snippet from, uh, from a page in, in my grades three through five uh, NSTA book, I'm able to hit a whole lot of science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and DCIs by doing a sequence that uh, focuses on students making those evidence-based claims. So what I'm showing here in this slide is all those diamonds in that invisible test tube uh, model lesson that you saw, all those diamonds are different dimensions that that hits. Uh, interestingly, it, it hits a whole lot more dimensions of the frameworks and a whole lot more of the dimensions of the NGSS than, than what's in those standard documents alone. So the standard documents would say that students just need to develop and use models. They need to use cause and effect for the cross-cutting concepts. And then they're making uh, or learning about electromagnetic radiation as the DCI. But by using an explore before explained sequence, I'm able to tap into a, a lot more of the different dimensions of those frameworks uh, to, to take the learning to a higher level, okay? So what's to come? I have a lot of things planned for this summer. So uh, the two examples today were just to give you a feel for what Explore Before Explain looks like and how, how you can scale it up or down uh, depending on the content that you wanna hit. But this summer we're gonna look at how do our gardens grow? So uh, it's definitely a life science topic, uh, an investigation that, that takes a couple days but teaches some very fundamental things about the needs of seeds and the needs of plants. We'll do some physics with how do marbles roll. We'll look at some chemistry uh, and definitely a topic that's uh, relevant to Colorado and here in St. Louis. Why do they put salt on the roads in the winter? We're gonna explore how can I make a shadow? And then uh, lastly, why do some objects stick to the refrigerator? Okay, so I have a lot planned for this summer and I, I'm super excited to share these ideas. I also uh, would love to hear back uh, from some of you all if you have questions or, or comments about Explore Before Explain teaching. Again, uh, here's how you can find me. And this video, it's all, uh, this presentation's all video too, so you're able to access this if you, if you want to find me, okay? So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm back, yeah, just me. And I wanted to see, are there any, are there any questions, clarifications, anything that, that you'd like me to talk about before I kind of hand it back over to uh, Tim to tell you a little bit more about this summer? I have a question. Um, so I see a lot of like elementary, middle school. Um, is there like high school units that you focus on? Uh, absolutely. I do focus on high school. It's not a theme of the summer workshop. The summer workshop, we did, we went K through eight. Um, and I think part of the reason it's, it's really hard to get a high school teacher in the same room as a kindergarten teacher and be able to do something that they all find meaningful. I, I will just put a pitch out for, for my latest book, Instructional Sequence Matters, is 9 through 12 Physical Science. So it's all, it just came out this April and it's all dedicated to, to 9 through 12 Physical Science. But um, I don't know, maybe next summer, Tim, we'll do a 9 through 12, a high school version. I'd love to do it, yeah. Yeah, if I could get Nolan in the room, we'd try to do it. Uh, but yeah. anyway, yeah. Uh, and thanks for creating that new resource for high school, because uh, I know how much both the elementary and the middle school books, people love those books. So thanks for creating that. And I think yeah. Nolan can see, too, that like, this approach, like those demos you did, there's such great phenomena that like kids are going to get engaged with those and that that whole approach to um, <clears throat> to doing it. And the idea, the thing I love about your stuff too, Pat, is that you're not creating a new lesson. You're taking a lesson you did and you're just using a kind of a simple three-step transformational process, which I think... <clears throat> 
can really work for high school um, as well as any grade level. Um, and so I, I think that's, I really like those, that, those ideas that you bring to the table as opposed to the 5e model and all these other you know uh pat and i talked uh yeah. about how you don't you know how uh the, they they suggest in the standards that you package this practice with this core disciplinary core idea and this cross-cutting idea and you have to package them in this way but I, i'm not sure i'm entirely on board I, there's so many different ways you can make it three-dimensional and not necessarily do it exactly that way and still hit everything. So I talked too much, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, Pat said he'd stick around for five or 10 minutes after we're done. So I think if it's okay, Anna and I will go ahead and wind this thing up uh, for, ten, for uh, tonight. For those of you that want to get out of here right at 45 minutes, if anybody wants to stick around, feel free for that. So summer is coming and we hope you're thinking about how you can kind of rejuvenate yourself with having some fun. Uh, this class that Pat is offering, as well as a couple of others are out there on our website uh, for this summer. But to emphasize Pat's class is June 24th and 25th. And then we're going to come back together one morning in the fall to kind of look at what kinds of interesting things people are doing and share your ideas. Pat will be there virtually with us uh, for that fall morning in September. Uh, and the two things I really want to emphasize here about the class this summer, uh, besides the things I already got bulleted, is there's going to be lots of prizes and we're going to have lots of fun. And there is no prerequisite. So if you didn't take Explore Before Explain 2, it's fine. You won't have missed anything. Pat's just going to be using more new examples and like ones from life science that you didn't necessarily get. And if you didn't, if you did take Pat's class, you can get credit for this class as well. You can get credit for both because he's covering new territory. So Colorado School of Mines will give you credit for both if you want, if you need it for relicensure. So check those out and you can find out about that class and Pat's other classes at dmns.org backslash tpdk12. So you've got a pencil, jot that down, but that's our uh, short URL. And I'm going to turn it over to Anna to talk about the final episode of the Tools at Tea Time season next, next Tuesday. How bittersweet. We are at the end. So we are going to welcome Tiffany Losasso, and she is a digital teacher librarian, and she is also a part of the Google um, movement for, for teachers. Um, so she is going to give us some great insight and tips um, to help us with Google. And um, I think that will be very, um, very important for us. And will build on what a uh, Robbie, um, who is a friend of Tiffany, uh, Tiffany's, uh, Robbie did our show last week. So it will build a little bit on that. Um, so we hope that you make that. And so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And I would ask if Pat wants to go to, uh, to grid view up there in the right hand corner, then he can see let's all give Pat a thumbs up a thank you clap whatever let's uh, we really appreciate you uh, giving your time freely tonight and for coming to Denver this summer uh, during your vacation we're looking forward to your visit and appreciate your great ideas always so all right so uh, yeah thanks. Th yeah, so uh, we're going to stick around if people have questions and answers. Otherwise, have a nice evening, and we really appreciate you joining us. We're going to keep it short because we want to respect Pat's time since he's an hour ahead. He's still at school, and his family would like him to come home someday. So. You know me, I always have a question. Uh, that's that's why we <laughs> hey, love you john. john fire away yeah can you just tell yeah. just uh share the story of your of your journey to to where you're at today yeah sure so are you a professor i mean you said no a teacher uh, yeah you know it's interesting i actually i started in higher ed and i have a phd in science education but um you know, my first job out was was at, at in in higher ed, and I always thought oh, I'm going to go on sabbatical one day, and I'm going to go back to the classroom and see if all that stuff that I learned about really works. 
And it actually, it went the other way. So I was only in higher ed for a couple years, two years, and I didn't feel like I was making the difference that I wanted to make in K-12 education. So I, I came back into an eighth grade teaching setting and I, uh, and I found out very quickly that it does all work. And I think that I was having just as much fun as those kids were in eighth grade physical science. Um, and I started to write. I started to write way more than I was writing as sort of a, as a professor and I liked it and I liked it a lot. Um, and then it just kind of all started to evolve. I found myself really kind of re rethinking my teaching and um, I was writing about it. And then um, at the same time, I think my districts um, saw that maybe what I was doing was working and I started to take over the PLCs. I became the science coordinator and we started to do more and more of it district wide. Um, and now I'm executive director of STEAM and CTE for a school district. And I've just kind of, feels like I'm just constantly kind of taking on more things and sort of doing this same thing with more different groups. And uh, I absolutely love it. So I, I wish I could be in the class more, but the way my position is now, it's almost all curriculum development. Well, thanks for sharing your journey with us. Yeah.